Story 1. I have been on patrol for several years and love stuff like this. I had a backup officer with me, who witnessed everything. Dispatch sent me on a call in a mountain area late one night. Dispatch said the caller reported several people holding a baby above their heads and chanting. While standing on her property, the call sounded ridiculous and I smirked as dispatch gave the details. I arrived at the proper address after driving about 20 minutes along a mountain road. There is not much else up here, and it was extremely quiet. No one walks around out here and there aren't very many cars driving this late. I walked along a gated driveway through a light wooded area. I found the caller's house with two dim lights near the front door. The house was surrounded on three sides by heavy woods. I felt a little uneasy just looking at the house. I knocked on the front door of the house while standing on a large patio. I heard something move to my left, which startled me because it was close. It sounded like a person, something big. I looked to the left and used my flashlight to light up the patio. I didn't see anyone. I continued to knock. I could hear two voices inside the house. I clearly heard a male and a female. This made me feel a little better. I thought I heard someone on the patio, but it must have been someone inside. The female eventually opened the door. She was terrified, almost crying. She asked me to come inside and to close the door. She led me to the living room, where I saw a very cheap security monitor, almost like a baby monitor camera setup with audio and video playing. The camera setup only provided a live feed. The camera was positioned to view the front door and patio area where I was just standing. The audio was silent as I watched the monitor for a few seconds. The woman began to explain when I interrupted and asked where the male was inside the house. I heard his voice. She looked confused and said she was here alone. I was surprised because I know for a fact I heard a male's voice when I knocked. I asked her several times and initially thought she was lying to me. My partner checked the house and did not find anyone. The woman said she was reading while sitting on the couch when she heard something over the security camera. She looked at the display and saw two people on the patio standing at the front door. She heard knocking at the door and called the police. I looked at the monitor, and although it was low quality, I could see the patio and front door area with decent clarity. As the woman continued to explain, the audio on the monitor went from quiet to extremely loud. We all stopped talking. The caller was shaking. I looked at the monitor but didn't see anyone. Loud audio continued to blast from the speakers. The audio sounded like wind, but it was not windy that night. I asked the woman, what is that? And she said, it's them. I looked at my partner who was nervous. The woman gave me her cell phone stating she took pictures of the monitor, showing the two people on her patio. I looked through several low quality pics and didn't see anything. I continued to scroll, and sure enough, I see what looks like two tall figures standing at the door. One of the figures is holding something. The figures looked strange, all dark and featureless, in contrast to the video I saw on the monitor. I was in disbelief and thought, oh my God, she's telling the truth. I continued to scroll and saw one figure holding something up over its head. Another picture showed the item at the base of the door with both figures standing near it. I tried to reason to explain what could have caused these images, but it was pretty apparent that there had been two subjects on her patio. We check outside, walking the property to the tree line. I mention the movement on the patio and the male voice from inside the house. My partner asks me to stop talking about it. We finish checking and return to speak with the caller. She says she will be driving into town and staying at a hotel because she is too scared to stay here tonight. We walk along the driveway back to our cars. My partner jumps into the patrol car and takes off. I laughed, but I felt really uneasy, standing there in the dark. I leave shortly afterward. Story 2. My dad was in the police force for 20 years, and when he was just a rookie, he had to conduct nighttime roadblocks meant to catch drunk drivers. They had done it many times before, and this night started routine enough for them. That was until this Toyota Corolla drove up to them with what looked like a white blanket on its roof, flapping in the wind. They thought it was weird, but did not see anything amiss about it. One of them even joked that this guy was multitasking by drying his laundry and driving home at the same time. The laugh stopped when the lone car came closer, and all of them saw what looked like a woman in white lying face down on top of the car. The woman seemed to slide like a slug backward until she disappeared behind the car as it eventually came to a stop in front of them. 
It took a few minutes for my dad's team to recompose themselves as they stared at each other as if to say, you guys saw that right? The most senior of them finally stepped up and shot the usual questions to the driver. There was a noticeable quiver in his voice as he made conversation and asked him to step out of the vehicle. My dad's team inspected the whole vehicle, including the boot, and found nothing strange in it. The driver was a good-looking staff sergeant in the army who was heading home from a company event earlier that night and admitted to having had a few cans of beer. He said he laid down in his bunk to sleep it off, hence why he was driving home at that time. It was 4 a.m. He passed their sobriety test and they started to ask him if he saw anything weird during his drive. Initially he said no, but after more questioning he mentioned that he had to swerve to avoid what looked like a bird that was flying upside down. It was spooky but didn't think that was a detail worth sharing with police officers. The senior then told the guy to chill out at a 24-hour coffee shop before heading home. The locals believe that if a malevolent spirit follows you, making a pit stop confuses them so they can't set up shop in your house. After some confusion of his own, the driver finally caught on and nodded in agreement. After the guy leaves, they call into the station and cut the night short. Never knew what happened to the driver. Hope he's all right. Story 3. When I was 19 to 21 years old, I was employed as a security enforcement officer through a local private investigator firm. I know I wasn't technically the LE you're asking for, but I've always wanted some place to share this story. I spent a 12 p.m., 12 a.m. shift at an upscale theater, and then my boss called me and told me I was assigned to a YMCA construction site that everyone kept calling out from. The sooner I could come in, the better, he said. So, after working 12 hours at the theater, I spent another few hours at that site. By the time I arrived home, it was around 9.30 and I was so tired I could barely keep my eyes open. But I received a phone call. It was my brother. His birthday was that day and I had completely forgotten about it. My whole family and I went shopping around and then ate at a restaurant about 45 minutes from my house. At around 1 p.m. I told them I had to leave because I just couldn't keep my eyes open. As I was driving home, no amount of music or driving with the windows down would keep my eyes open. I started drifting into the opposite lane of traffic. I decided it was best if I pulled over. I looked around and there was an ice cream shop, so I stopped in. It was a weird place for it to be because the highway I was driving on was a smaller country highway and it was on the outskirts of town. So, an odd place to put a shop that would seem to rely on foot traffic. There was a woman out front asking if I had stopped for ice cream. I didn't want to be a dick and just tell her I wanted a nap, so I said yes. I went inside and it was rather junky. It looked like they bought furniture from old barbecue restaurants and threw it at random into the building. The same woman was now behind the counter. I said I wanted two scoops of chocolate on a cone and pulled out my bank's debit card. We don't take cards here, she said. She handed me the ice cream cone. I dug around in my pockets and went back to my truck for change. I never keep anything but a debit card on me, but I found about 50 cents and I gave it to her. She said the price was 180, but that'll do. I didn't know what else to do because I was half asleep and she had given me the ice cream cone already. Despite the fact I was attempting to pay with a debit card as she was making it, I said thanks and walked outside to stand and eat it. I'm a pig when I eat, so by the time I made it to my truck, I had some already on my face and uniform. Before I could make it to my truck, the woman walked outside to talk to me. You look troubled, she said, but whatever you're going through, you'll be fine. I get in my truck and leave this, I'm now assuming, batshit crazy ice cream vendor. I get home and fall asleep. The next day I'm getting my uniform ready when I see chocolate ice cream on my uniform shirt. The ice cream shop wasn't far away from my house, so I felt I should go pay her what I owed. I pulled up to the building, but it was locked. Their building was empty and there was a sheet of dust caked over the doors like no one had touched them in years. Story 4. I'm Officer Bradley. I retired from the force 10 years ago at the ripe age of 50. I'll begin with a story from my 20 years as a police officer that stuck with me like a deep thorn. January 17, 2005. We got a call about a woman who had locked herself in her bathroom. She said her boyfriend was trying to kill her. My partner Mason and I arrived at a house at the end of a street. The lamp posts flickered yellow and the wind danced the trees and bushes. The clouds were thick and the air ice cold. We took a position at the front door. We knocked. 
Police, open up. Only the sound of wind chimes. Mason kicked the door open with all the force he could muster. We scanned the house downstairs. No one in sight, clear. You hear that, I said. Mason looked up at the stairs. Gentle cries, a woman. So subtle and as if muffled behind a door in a room. Thought she was supposed to be downstairs, said Mason. We made our way upstairs. Ma'am, it's okay, I began. You're safe now. No one's going to hurt you. The crying stopped abruptly as if someone hit a pose. Then it started again. But he's still here, replied the woman from inside the bedroom. My partner and I checked the entire house. No one's here, ma'am. You're safe. Downstairs, the front door slammed shut. My partner and I gave each other a gaze, and I could notice his brow sweating despite the cold night. I used my head to gesture for him to take a look. He stood from atop the stairs and looked down at the front door. Just the wind, I think, he said. Then a gentle voice came from inside the bathroom. Are you sure, Officer Bradley? The woman asked. The entire night at that scene, neither my partner Mason nor I used our names out loud. Not once. Ma'am, do you need help or not? Mason was agitated. We need to know you're okay, so step back because I'm kicking it in. A part of me believes Mason was more eager to see the woman's face, to find out who she was and how she knew what she did than he was for her safety. He wanted peace of mind. No, hold on, hold on, I said. She might be sitting right by the door, we don't want to hurt her. Then she said it. Officer Bradley, tell Mason that if he touches this door, I will visit his family in the late hours of a certain night and break down a door of my own. The woman's voice was an octave deeper when she said that. I never understood the expression, white as a ghost. Do people actually turn that pale in the face? I learned that they in fact did when I saw my partner react to those sinister words. I couldn't stop him from kicking in that bedroom door this time, but when he did, we found nobody inside. There wasn't a window above the shower through which to escape or another door to go through. And yet, we were certain that we just had a full conversation with a woman behind this door. We scanned the entire house, including the backyard, one last time, inch by inch. Nothing. My partner and I communicated non-verbally the rest of the night. So when it was time to leave, we gave each other a look and left the house without even looking back. Now this is the part of the story I haven't told anyone, not even Mason. We were sufficiently disturbed, so I didn't want to tell him what I was about to tell you. When we left the house, I drove us back to the station that night. He probably thought I didn't notice, but his hands were shaking too much to drive comfortably. He doesn't drink coffee. As I reversed the cruiser out the street, Mason didn't look back at the house. But the truth is, I did. And I sincerely wish that I hadn't. I looked and squinted at a garbage can by the side of the house to see a strange, dark figure kneeling by the gate, as if watching us leave. Story 5. I'm a detective and spent some time as an expert on sex crimes and crimes against children. It was the best, worst assignment I've had. In one case, I had come in at midnight. A young woman with a toddler comes into one of the precincts to report her ex-boyfriend raped her during a custody argument. Long story short, it was legit and one of the most violent and sadistic cases I've ever had, so I'll spare the gruesome details. I still have no idea how this woman made her own way to a precinct with a toddler. Part of the investigation requires me to talk to the toddler. The victim said the toddler was present for everything. I'm a child forensic interviewer as well. During the interview, the toddler recalls their father becoming angry and hitting the mom. Then, the toddler said that the nice woman showed up and she couldn't see past the nice woman. The nice woman held her and told her that they were both going to be safe and sang her a song in a different language. The toddler said the nice woman went over to the front door and knocked on the door, then, the nice woman helps them and their mom to the car before flying away. In the victim's interview, she said that her ex-boyfriend had a knife to her throat and put it on the skin to cut her throat open, but he got distracted for some reason and then ran out of the apartment. She had no explanation why. The suspect was caught about eight hours later. He confessed to absolutely everything. When I asked him about the knife to the throat, he said this, I swear to God I was gonna cut the bitch's throat open. But I thought I heard a knock at the door and thought it was the police. Once I saw it was clear, I ran outside. He is now serving life in prison, and the mom and toddler are safe and doing well. 
I'd love to know more about the niece woman. Story 6. This actually happened to a friend of mine who isn't the cop in this story but is actually family. So this happened maybe about five years ago. My friend is in his mid-thirties. He and his wife had a seven-month-old baby and a five-year-old son. His wife was a stay-at-home mom and his dad owned his own business and had a very flexible schedule. He would take his son to school in the morning, pick him up, etc. It's about 11 a.m. they call the cops because they keep hearing a strange sound in the home sound like feet or something. And though he was sure it was nothing, he wanted to make sure. So, he says the cop arrives, and the first thing the cop says is, Why isn't your son in school? My friend is puzzled and says, Huh. The cop says, Your boy is sitting outside on your lawn. My friend again looks at the cop strangely, looks at the lawn, and says, Officer, my son is in school. I dropped him off this morning. The officer looks back, sees nothing, and looks puzzled. At that moment, my friend's cell phone rang, and it was his son's school. Apparently, he had had some sort of allergic reaction to some finger paints that had an egg base or something in it, allergic to eggs, and became extremely swollen, his throat swollen, and couldn't breathe, rushed to the hospital. The cops give them an escort to the hospital so they can fly through lights and all. Arrived at the hospital, and the son was doing fine. His stable got the little shot to help him and everything. The cop waits to see how the family is doing and wants to check on the kid. My friend is appreciative and lets the cop come up and he says that he had never seen a paler face in his life. And he said the cop looked as if he had seen a ghost and said, that's the kid I saw in your yard. My friend told me this, it creeped me the fuck out. I didn't believe it, but the wife co-signed the whole thing. Story seven, I was an EMT for a while. We got a call about someone who was riding their bike at a breakneck speed when they hit a car head first without a helmet. We went over it immediately, despite the fact that it was broad daylight and we were in the middle of suburbia on a Saturday. day, nobody even came to check on this poor guy. Seriously, the streets were empty. Usually, a massive crowd gathers around violent accidents like this. So, his skull was pretty much smashed in, and he was unresponsive. It was the worst head injury I'd ever seen. We assessed that he had a major skull fracture and a concussion, and he was bleeding profusely. He was also missing teeth and had a minor road rash, but fortunately he wasn't missing much skin. To give you an idea of how bad it was, this was the kind of injury that most people don't survive. If you did survive, you'd basically be a crippled vegetable. Normally we would have moved him off the road, but when someone has a head neck injury, that isn't very safe. My partner, who was also training me as I was still kind of new, went to check his pulse while I began to unload our gear. He crouched down, felt for a pulse for a while, and then stood up and opened his mouth to say something. Suddenly, the guy fucking jumped up. He didn't use his arms to pick himself up, he just fucking jumped to his feet. It startled the two of us. He looked at us, smiled, and attempted to grab his bike. We tried to stop him, but we didn't exactly want to wrestle him to the ground given his condition. He gets away from us and bolts into the woods without his bike. My partner was in even more disbelief than I was. He just stared at where the man had run off, mouth agape. Then he turned to me and muttered, he had no fucking pulse, man. I asked him if he was sure, and he swore up and down that the biker was clinically dead. We contacted the authorities for assistance, and they sent a search and rescue team into the forest. I don't know if he was found or not, because we normally don't get much information about patients after they go to the professionals. Keep in mind that this was the Pine Barrens, so they had a lot of ground to cover. My best guess is that he went to a loved one's house out of confusion. What I found out about that is, head injuries bleed like fucking hell. So you'd think the guy would leave a long red trail of blood for the cops to follow. Story 8. Before my dad became a state police officer, he did some security work at a big factory. He's not normally a superstitious person. So when he told me this story with such a weird seriousness to it, it kind of scared the shit out of me. He's always said, I don't mess with that stuff regarding supernatural things, but anyway. This story is in the early 80s. While working at the factory, he always had the night shift. It was just him and the big ass factory. He had his own little room where he could watch TV, listen to the radio, and do whatever. But the rest of the factory, for the most part, besides the exits, was dark. His job was to actually patrol the factory every hour. He'd get up, grab his flashlight, and just stroll around the place going down row by row, peeking his head out left to right. 
One night he set out to do his usual run with flashlight in hand, but he could see that something was unusual to his eye when he walked out into the dark. You know that sensation you get when your eyes adjust to the room and you can just start to make out certain objects but nothing full or whole? There was something darker in the main hall or row, and it was moving. He paused for a minute and as his eyes fully adjusted, there seemed to be nothing. He took a second to swipe the factory with his light and then decided that he was just seeing things. He went down into the main row and started his run. Everything was normal, nothing out of the ordinary, although he was still a bit on edge, seeing as the factory without a big moving shadow was creepy enough. When the rows of the factory ended, there was a big open area at the end. This was the entrance to the factory. Normally, there would be a light at the front door, but tonight it had dimmed lower. He thought that was weird and really began to sweat. So instead of investigating any further, he turned from the exit and went to go back into the main row and get back up to his room. That's when, in the corner of his eye, on the right side, he could see what he described as a black cloaked figure. His light hit it and he saw it, tall and distinctly human-like, but he didn't stop. He just went right back to his room, lock at the door, and stay it in there until it was light out. He left the factory and called the owner to tell him he wouldn't be returning to the job. I don't blame him.